Hey, thanks for tuning in to the Exponential Performance Podcast. Uh, in today's episode, to be honest, it's just a complete and utter geek out. We jump into lessons from the lab uh, talking about gelatin supplementation and how that can improve collagen production for those that are struggling with uh, tendon and ligament injuries. Then the Geek Fest absolutely continues as we dive into a interview with Dr. Evelyn Parr about alcohol and performance and also low carbohydrate, high fat diets. And then we wrap it up with a question and answer about masters athletes and how training should be different for masters versus younger athletes so that's enough from me let's get into it welcome to the exponential performance podcast join sports scientist and performance coach maddie graham to find out how to train smarter and maximize your performance no matter who you are Alrighty, let's get this road on the show. Welcome to episode 6 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. It is bloody good to have you here tuned in listening. Now, just before we crack into things, I am extremely excited to say that today's show is sponsored by Sweet Cheeks Butt Butter. Sweet Cheeks Butt Butter is hands down the best chamois cream I have ever used. I have given this chamois cream some of the most roughest, rigorous testing I can think of. I used it when I did the tour of Aotearoa 3,000 kilometer bikepacking event from Cape Reinga to to Bluff down the length of New Zealand and also in a number of other brevets. Sweet Cheeks Butt Butter. You can check them out over on sweetcheeksnz.co.nz. Now, it's not just chamois cream that they do, but also they do an amazing hot cheeks, which is their natural heat rub. Fantastic for rubbing out those aches and pains. I am currently using it to uh, massage my quads because I've got quite a bad dose of tendonitis in my quadricep uh, tendon. Uh, And also... Something that I hadn't used before until I got some sent to me the other day was the Sweet Cheeks Super Balm. This has been fantastic, actually. I find this really good for just general skin care. Ever since moving up to the beautiful Wanaka area, I found my skin's really dry, especially my hands when I'm in the gym lifting and also out on the bike. But Sweet Cheeks Super Balm seems to do the trick. So... Sweet Cheeks, check it out. Thank you very much for being the first Exponential Performance Show sponsor. I hope you have had a good week so far. I hope you enjoyed last week's podcast. If you haven't checked out last week's podcast, make sure you get back and check that out. Especially the stuff about training your gut. It is so important leading into a big race. So if you haven't done that, make sure you do it. Also... It would be greatly appreciated if you can head over to iTunes. Now, it has to be iTunes. If you can head over to iTunes and leave this podcast a ranking, give it a ranking in iTunes, ideally five stars or wherever you feel it sits, and it would be so awesome if you could leave a review. All this does is it helps this show rate higher in the iTunes listings. And this is going to help maintain this show in the long term by making it rank higher. So please, head over to iTunes and leave me a comment. If you are listening on YouTube, please hit the thumbs up. Leave a comment below what you enjoy about the show. So without further ado, let's crack in to Lessons from the lab. <laughs> it's alive. It's alive. All right. L- lessons from the lab. Now, this research paper really caught my eye um, just the other week, and it is in- it is titled "Vitamin C Enriched Gelatin Supplementation Before Intermittent Activity." augments collagen synthesis so what the hell does this mean this is a research paper that 
appeared in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Um, and I'll, I'll post a link to the abstract because it's, it's quite quite interesting. And I found it I found it super interesting to be honest with you, and highly applicable to a number of athletes that I work with uh, that are struggling with just little um, tendon and ligament issues. So what they found is that you can actually improve your collagen content of your tendons or ligaments by simply consuming 15 grams of gelatin before skipping exercise, which is quite awesome actually because it has a lot of real world implications for those that are are struggling with tendon injuries. And myself at the moment have got two little niggly little tendon issues i've got my uh quadriceps tendon at the top of my knee i'm struggling with a bit of tendonitis in there at the moment um as a bit of a hangover from the great southern brevet um, mountain bike event that i did 1100 kilometers on the mountain bike really find that it hammers your knees and it's just hasn't been right since and the other one is in my forearm, again, from that same mountain biking event, just the hammering that it got. So this really caught my eye, and it's something that I am doing myself at the moment to try and get these injuries healed. So what they did is simply um, supplemented with 15 grams of gelatin each day for six days, and the participant then skipped for six minutes just to give that high um, impact loading. And then what they found is that the the ligaments that they were testing, and they tested these, are called engineered ligaments. So what they've done is they've got a piece of human ligament, and they use the anterior cruciate ligament out of the knee in this example. They have it in a in a petri dish or some sort of you know laboratory dish, and what they do is they are able to get this tendon to bind and then to grow as it would in the human body. And then they've taken the blood from these participants that have consumed the gelatin and then put it in and around the tendon to soak up. Following this, they then dry the tendon out and measure the actual weight of it so they can see how much it grows, how much volume it actually increases by. And they're also being able to test the tensile strength of the ligament. So it's such an interesting uh, experiment that they do and pretty amazing technology that they're able to um, test ligaments uh, in this in this way. Um, I'm using the term uh, throwing tendons and ligaments around uh, sort of interchangeably here because um, a, the, the difference between them is a ligament attaches bone to bone and a tendon Uh, attaches muscle to a bone in this example they used a anterior cruciate ligament but tendons and ligaments are essentially made from the same thing so apologies if i throw them back and forth a little bit but why would consuming 15 grams of gelatin improve collagen synthesis well it's really interesting because uh, gelatin, when you think about it, is simply, um, in this case anyway, ground up beef skin. And the amino acid profile of gelatin is very, very similar to collagen in the body. And collagen is what forms ligaments and tendons. So having the extra raw material floating around in the blood it gives the body everything that it needs to produce this collagen. And what was found is that they actually did a placebo. So they mixed this gelatin up in uh, Ribena juice or black currant juice and the participant drank it. So they had a placebo so no one knew what they were getting. So they drink the placebo or the real thing. And then they actually did a 5 gram dose of gelatin or, and because it was a random crossover, a 15 dose dosage as well. So they were able to see that 5 grams gave an improvement over the the placebo, but 15 grams gave 
almost a twofold increase over the placebo. So you're getting twice as much collagen formation versus just doing the skipping. And that skipping exercise has been shown to improve collagen production as well because it's a you know a natural stress on the tendons and ligaments so they adapt to that. What does this actually mean in the real world and if you're having little issues with tendonitis or potentially you've had a, a tendon um, issue or a surgery this could actually help you uh, improve your recovery make a you know good strong tendon or ligament so that you hopefully don't have any issues in the future. So what does it mean in the real world and what can you do? The first thing is if you do have a serious tendon issue or you've got ongoing problems, highly recommend going and see a physiotherapist or a doctor to get a referral to a physio. This is by no means medical advice and should it not it should not be interpreted as medical advice. This is just me giving you guys some some information and some research about you know things that are coming out. So what I'm doing and what I'm taking from this research is each day I am consuming about 400 mils of um, juice, Ribena juice or whatever is available at the time. So it's important that it has vitamin C in the drink as well because vitamin C... Um, plays a key role in activating one of the key enzymes that is important for collagen cross-linking. So whatever the drink that you're consuming with the gelatin, make sure it's high in vitamin C. So I'm putting in 15 grams of gelatin, which is approximately 3 teaspoons. I keep the teaspoon relatively heaped, so you can guarantee you're getting at least 15 grams out of it. Mix that up and consume that over the next wee while. Try and keep it within about 10 minutes. And then I time that so that is uh, that is one hour before some skipping. Or if I am doing a, a strength workout, I will replace the skipping with the strength workout or include skipping in my strength workout. It's important that the load that you are doing is relatively short and also tendon and ligament promoting uh, in terms of the, the load. Tendons really like short uh, shock load, and that's why skipping is being used in this example. And they also really like eccentric-based training as well. So the idea is that all of that, all those amino acids from the gelatin are circulating around your system. You do your strength training, or you're skipping, which stimulates the collagen synthesis in the tendons or ligaments. Then the body goes through that uh, process of making new collagen, and it's got everything to do that. So it's able to do that extremely effectively. So that is what I'm doing at the moment. That's how I'm interpreting this research and it's something that I'm going to be using with um, a number of my athletes that have been struggling with those little niggly um, tendonitis, pulled, pulled tendons, trouble with their Achilles, that sort of thing. There are some side effects with uh, gelatin consumption, and those are, it can cause quite a bloated feeling in your stomach or a feeling of fullness, just because you've obviously smashed quite a lot of it at once. There is some potential for uh, constipation um, or potentially diarrhea is the other one, but in my experience with it, I haven't um, had any of those problems. And it can also leave a, leave a bad taste in your mouth or some reflux. So on the whole, nothing overly major, I would say. There's no real negative effects from consuming gelatin around that 15 gram mark um, each day. And the benefits of it seem to be really effective and and very promising as well. If you've got any more questions about the use of gelatin supplementation for uh, collagen synthesis, let me know. Um, I'll post a link so you can check out the paper um, firsthand. And it is a really interesting interesting research. 
and quite awesome as well in the way that they've gone about it and they're able to engineer these ligaments to to test them. It's quite incredible. So uh, it's definitely something that requires more research as well and no doubt we'll be seeing more coming out in this space. And it won't be too long, I imagine, before some marketing company jumps on this as well and produces some sort of supplement that they charge you an arm and a leg for. But for now, all you need to do is grab some gelatin from the supermarket. So there you have it. Let's wrap it up there. That's Lessons from the Lab. Done. Now I'd like to introduce to you our guest for today, and that is Dr. Evelyn Parr. I first met uh, Evelyn uh, when I was studying at Otago University, and she is definitely one of the reasons that I pursued my master's. Um, She was one of my lab demonstrators there for a while, and then went on to become one of my uh, research colleagues and a very good friend of mine. Um, She did a combined a physical education and chemistry degree at Otago University before doing her master's and then she went on to do a PhD in Australia at RMIT uh, and now is in Melbourne um, doing a four-year postdoctorate in exercise and nutrition. She is an absolute wealth of knowledge and is somebody that I highly respect and go to often with questions. So I'm absolutely pumped to have her on the podcast today and we're going to dig into some discussion around her research on alcohol and performance and training adaptations and also low carb high fat diets she is seriously at the forefront of this research rubbing shoulders with the guys and the girls that are doing the research and also doing the research herself so without further ado Here is my call with Dr. Evelyn Parr. Alrighty, so um, we'll kick off into the work. Tell us what. Tell us about the work that you did around alcohol and performance. So uh, the first study for my PhD, uh, we knew a lot from animal studies in terms of how alcohol affected uh, muscle and and rodents and kind of had this idea that we know that athletic performance is is typically impaired by alcohol and it's normally because people make bad choices and when they consume alcohol they forget their other sort of recovery nutrition um, guides I, I, I guess I'd say but we didn't really know sort of what's actually happening in the muscle we had a bit of information from from New Zealand, from the guys up at, um, oh, correct me if I'm wrong, Maddie at Waikato, that had done a lot of work with alcohol consumption and, and force production. Um, and it was very um, mechanistic in a way that they were using single leg exercise to uh, after alcohol consumption and, and looking at the performance outcome, but not really looking at what was actually happening in the muscle. And I was really lucky that I joined the lab um, that I'm in where we do a lot of muscle biopsies and look at the the genes and proteins that are involved in um, protein synthesis or, or building muscle. Um, so we, we kind of got interested and in it. it was just a, a good first study um, for me to run in terms of, okay, well, what if we get somebody to do a typical concurrent exercise session where there's some form of uh, endurance aspect and there's some resistance aspect um, and a little sprint aspect in there as well to try and make it as much like a team sport which is is really where you see the excess of alcohol consumption after exercise um, and make it relevant so um, give these guys a a dose of exercise and then sort of let them drink uh, in a controlled scientific manner uh, afterwards and see if protein consumption after exercise, which we know is beneficial, um, could rescue some of those detrimental effects we expected to see from the alcohol. Um, and then how bad was it in terms of compared to the gold standard of just having protein without the alcohol? Um, I have to say it was a reasonably easy study to recruit for. I do a lot of muscle biopsy studies, but I'm um, telling people that they're going to um, consume a fair few beverages did seem to, to help. 
um, scared a few off when we did say biopsies, but um, yeah, it was a really interesting study to run. So what you did is you got people to come into the lab and put them through that exercise regime, and yeah. then following that, how much did they drink? Yeah, okay. So uh, they had a one-hour sort of break after exercise, and 30 minutes after is when they had their um, protein or carbohydrate. Well, I've, now I'm wondering if we had it immediately after. I'm pretty sure it was 30 minutes after. Um, and they started consuming alcohol one hour after exercise, um, and they consumed their alcohol across three hours, so across um, six different uh, six portions of, of alcohol across the three hours. Um, and we we used a, a similar regime to um, Louise Burke's paper, which was published um, a fair amount earlier than ours. Um, again, I'd have to look it up, but I believe it was 2003. And she was more looking at muscle glycogen resynthesis and whether alcohol impaired the sort of, um, yeah, the regain of muscle glycogen after exercise or after endurance exercise. Um, because we were more interested in protein synthesis, our uh, exercise had more of a resistance component. So we gave them 1.5 grams per kilo of body mass of alcohol. Um, I guess to put that into realistic, understandable terms, there's 10 grams of alcohol in one shot um, of, of vodka. So our guys had um, around about 12 standard drinks. Um, plus or minus depending on the size so we had one of the, one of our smaller guys had nine standard drinks and uh, our largest guy had 14 standard drinks across that three hour period so they were basically sounds really like fun but they were basically given a, a drink you know at a, a certain time and given five minutes to get it down basically so it wasn't a you know lazing around the pub sort of consuming it when you want to sort of situ situation but um, there certainly were some happy guys in the lab uh, those alcohol days. Well, that's classic. And so then after they consumed that alcohol, then you took muscle biopsies. Can you explain a little bit behind what a muscle biopsy is? Yeah, I mean, I think biopsy is a term that's thrown around in the medical world quite a lot, and it can mean a different uh, it means different things on, on depending on what is being biopsied. Um, when we talk about muscle biopsies, we're talking about taking a small portion of the vastus lateralis or the part of the quad, the outer quad muscle. Um, what that involves is local anaesthetic um, to numb the area. Um, it involves a scalpel blade to make an incision through the fascia around the muscle. Um, I described it in the lab the other day as a piece of glad wrap around the muscle and the doc sort of corrected me and said it's probably more like wetsuit material. It's a bit thicker um, than glad wrap. So we use the, the scalpel blade to pierce through the fascia and, and then we use a six millimeter Bergstrom needle um, that gets inserted into the muscle and we use some um, suction to then sort of grab the muscle into the, the side of the needle and, and the doctor then makes little snips to end up with a, a nice little cylinder of muscle that typically weighs around 150 uh, milligrams. Um, the more the better for us in terms of analysis uh, and for the for the participant it means sort of 20-ish seconds max of us kind of mucking around in their leg. Um, obviously for them the quicker the, the better and, and we try and do that. Um, it just depends on, on the doc at the time. Uh, so they had a biopsy one hour into drinking, so two hours post-exercise, and then they had their second biopsy uh, eight hours post-exercise. So there were a, a six-hour window between the two the two periods, and obviously they'd, they'd finished, well finished their alcohol by that last biopsy. And so what did, what came out of it? What did you guys find? Well, um, our main question was, does protein rescue uh rescue the detrimental effects of alcohol. We certainly found that alcohol was detrimental. Um, there's still some benefits to the exercise, so protein synthesis was still higher than it is at rest. Um, so naturally, we're, we're turning over our muscle at, at a, a, a slow rate, which means um, that if you look at your forearm, in about two to three months, you'll have a different, completely different muscle in that forearm due to the rate of protein synthesis. Um, and when we exercise, we upregulate that. So. The exercise and alcohol condition certainly upregulated that, so the effect of exercise is still there, even when you do consume a large amount of alcohol after exercise. Um, but having the protein as well as alcohol had a, a greater effect, so there was a, a, an enhanced muscle protein synthesis or a rescued uh, muscle protein synthesis, 
but it, both of those alcohol conditions were lower, significantly lower than having protein alone. Um, so there's certainly some blunting of the typical responses we see to exercise and protein ingestion when alcohol is consumed. And, and just referencing back to that paper that you were talking about um, from Louise Burke in 2003 or whenever it was, mm-hmm. what, did they, what did they find regarding muscle glycogen? Do you remember? Yeah, there was actually no effect. So whether they had uh, the alcohol or not, it didn't change their body's ability to replenish the glycogen stores, which I guess was not really what they expected. Um, and um, I can't, I haven't read that paper for, for quite some time, um, but their, their rationale for, for why they thought that was typically that, um, as I said before, when people are drinking, they're not consuming um sort of the right foods in terms of repair or replenishing of, of muscle glycogen. But, yeah, it seemed that the, the alcohol didn't have um, such a, an effect as they, they expected. Oh, nice. So if you're, your advice to an athlete following training, uh, what would that be? Say, let's say an endurance athlete. In terms of training, day-to-day training? Yeah, yeah, in terms of if they were going to, you know, uh, go home and have, you know, some drinks after a training session at the end of the day or... Yeah, great question. And something I get asked all the time in terms of, oh, you know, you gave them 12 standard drinks, who does that? And, well, we know that there are a lot of, you know, teams, as I said before, team sport athletes that do that. Uh, With regards to whether, you know, one or two drinks um, is going to have an effect, I really don't know. Um, I don't think we know in terms of from a scientific perspective, from a... um, I guess a general health perspective, I can't see that that amount of alcohol is going to have a huge effect knowing the benefits of, of exercise or the stress that exercise um, puts on, on the muscle and on the metabolic system. So I'd love to do a dose response. That's definitely something that would be of interest. Um, but I can't see, you know, a couple of drinks being being a bad thing and it just depends it's like any sort of periodized nutrition and training I mean if you've just done a hard session it's probably not a good idea to put any alcohol in um, if it's an, an easy day maybe it, it's not such a bad thing and and I guess for some people alcohol is more a, a mental recovery type situation or a celebration um, situation around um, various events So, in general, if you were trying to get the maximal gains out of your training sessions, you'd say avoid alcohol because any any alcohol is going to have potential implications in terms of optimal recovery, but some alcohol would be okay. Where would you put it on that? I think I'd go with more of the some alcohol is okay. I'm, I'm very much of the um, don't ban anything. It, it doesn't make you um, any any better from um, completely cutting something out and it normally, you know, makes things more difficult or makes it, the binge at, at the end bigger and, and potentially has other detrimental effects. Yeah, I think it's just sensible. I think it's just – and I think – from an endurance perspective, especially when you're looking at individual athletes, I think that's definitely what they are. Like most, in, when you're an individual athlete, you only have yourself to to put on the line, and, and you don't have another, you know, six, seven, however many teammates to, to rely back on if your performance isn't great on that day. Um, so I think from an individual athlete perspective, uh, people are pretty sensible and, and pretty, you know, um, probably over cautious or. Um, yeah, overzealous in that respect of, of cutting alcohol out in, in that in that season. But I mean, it's the icing on the cake, really. With you know, with nutrition and, and peak performance, it can really make or break, and really be one of those one percenters. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm pretty on the fence with that one. I think it, it comes down to the individual. It comes down to their situation. Um, as Jim Cotter would say, it depends, Maddie. It does depend. Um, and if you are gonna uh, if you are gonna drink following training, make sure you you know you nailed your protein carbohydrate replacement. Pretty much, and timing. Like I mean, if you're doing an, an afternoon training session leading straight into a drinking session, that's when you're probably going to have um, a, a bigger a detrimental effect to that training that you've actually done. 
um, rather than if you'd spread it out and you'd done your training earlier in the day, had appropriate nutrition uh, in terms of recovery, and then you had um, you know period of, of drinking later on. Yeah, again, it's it's being sensible and, and timing it, and again, life happens sometimes, and you have to fit in an afternoon session, and then you have someone's. 21st or 50th or birthday or whatever it is um and yeah it's, it's all about just trying to fit it in the best way that you can yeah there's always that uh always been that sort of myth or saying out there that like if you have a massive massive night drinking it's like undoing a week of training no doubt you've heard oh, that yeah definitely i mean looking at we only looked at the eight hours post the exercise session. Um, and as I said before, there were definitely still some benefits of doing the exercise session. It wasn't completely squashed. Um, the adaptations probably were less. Um, I don't know if it's more to do with the metabolic adaptations to that alcohol consumption or the other added you know, benefits of lack of sleep, um, inappropriate nutrition the day after, those sort of things that all add up probably have more of a detriment to training than the actual alcohol itself. But so, yeah, more of the effects of consuming the alcohol. Uh, we're talking about large doses here rather than, you know, one or two two drinks. Yeah, yeah. And also those other things that can happen when you're uh, having a big <laughs> night on the town as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think we know that alcohol kind of, loosens people up and it means that sometimes decisions aren't made in the in the best possible mindset um and and then obviously the next day um there can be some you know follow-on effects and if you're as old as i am it's two days after as well so um it, yeah it's it's just about making making smart decisions or, or planning or yeah i mean it's if it's end of season it's end of season you've only got the other choices in your life to work around rather than your sporting sort of outcomes awesome no that's really cool and i'll put a link to the to your paper as well um in the yep. show notes as well so people can track that down and so what other work have you been doing in terms was it you've been involved in some low low carbohydrate high fat yeah, one of our PhD students, um, Jill Leckie, is doing uh, her PhD uh, around sort of nutrition, well, we all are, nutrition and exercise. Hers is from a, a performance perspective and um, had a, an honours student at the same time as Jill was doing her first PhD study and we looked at both running and cycling uh, in terms of the duration of or, and typical intensities of an event or trying to replicate that and um, blocking fat metabolism and seeing whether that had how that had an effect on on performance so there's obviously a lot in the media of high fat diets and trying to upregulate fat metabolism and i think what what commonly gets missed is the intensity that exercise is performed at really does determine what fuels are utilized so and you were course, you were blocking fat metabolism yeah so how does that uh, work we used, so we used her, an agent called uh, nicotinic acid which is uh, b3 b3 or b6 um, and, and it basically blocks the lipolysis of free fatty acids. So it, it blocks the breakdown from a triglyceride um, into a, a, a free fatty acid. That, a free fatty acid, when it's in the bloodstream, is what the body uses to break down and therefore produce energy from fat. So if you block the lipolysis or block the breakdown of, of free fatty acids, you essentially mean that the body can use the intramuscular triglycerides, so it still can use some fat stores um, but the main way that we release fat into the bloodstream to be used during the exercise was blocked so it means that you rely more on your carbohydrate metabolism obviously um, and we're looking at the different in, in terms of cycling the different lengths of, of performance um, again very laboratory based so 30 60 uh, sorry a 60 90 and 120 minute time trial and looking at whether blocking the release of free fatty acids had an effect at, at those durations. And, and then what Jill did in um, running was looking at a simulated half marathon um, and whether feeding with carbohydrate before um, or competing with fasted um, and as well as using the nicotinic acid to see how that affected the uh, simulated half marathon performance. So you essentially block 
the um, metabolism of fat to see if that had any effect on it. On performance, yeah. With the idea that why would you train so hard to upregulate fat metabolism if it didn't actually have an effect on performance at all? Yeah, correct. I mean, uh, on my supervisor, um, John Hawley, would say that, you know, performance is, is what's, or, you know, gold medals are won at the Olympics, and the longest Olympic event is, is a marathon, which is typically just on two hours. So if we're looking at those sort of events and those sort of durations, how how much are we relying on fat? How important is fat in those situations to fuel exercise? Um yeah, that's what they were looking at. And how did that the results come out of that? So in terms of the, the study that I was helping with in terms of the cyclists, uh, it, the nicotinic acid or the um, vitamin B3 only had an effect uh, in the 120-minute cycle performance. So when you looked at the, the 60 and 90-minute time trials, there was, there was no difference between, between the conditions. It didn't matter whether um, we blocked the release of free fatty acids or not, uh, they were still able to perform um, similarly. Um, when you got to the 120 uh, minute uh, TT, uh, that's where the, the difference um, seemed to be. And if you did block the, the free fatty acids, then there was a detriment to performance and the intensity had to decline um, to save, I guess, or savor the carbohydrate that was being used. So you would assume that Obviously, longer longer distance events have higher reliance on fat metabolism. Exactly, yeah. Um, and in Jill's study, they didn't find any difference um, when they had the nicotinic acid in terms of their half marathon. And we're talking about they were they had to be less than ninety minutes for a half marathon, so they were reasonably well trained individuals. Um, and I guess that's the you know some of the other issues with. That some of the studies that are published and, and sort of make comment to um, upregulating fat metabolism, you, you look at their intensity of, of exercise and it's typically sort of 65% VO2 max, um, or you look at the training status of their individuals and their sort of, you know, VO2 max is of 40 to 50 mils per um, per litre per, per, ca- or sorry, per kg per minute, um, which is a different kettle of fish to somebody that's really well well trained um, and working at a, a high percentage of their VO2 max. So I guess what that, that's what those two studies were, were trying to look at. For sure. And then what what's your opinion around or your insight around the low carbohydrate, high fat uh, during training in sort of a periodized manner? I think um, the study that's come out from Louise Burke and um, the team at the AIS with the elite race walkers lately kind of really sums that up. Um, I think the nutrition guidelines or the you know sports nutrition guidelines of late have been given a bit of a hammering of people say, oh, you don't really need all this carbohydrate all the time. And I don't think that's what they were trying to say. And certainly they've been revamped. And last year you'd see that um, in a publication by the first author's Thomas, I believe. Um, it, sports dietitians aren't really telling people to eat or consume carbohydrate all the time. It really should be periodized around training sessions. So in the same way that, that carbohydrates are periodized, I think fat can be periodized as well. But um, that's exactly what um, Louise's study is, has shown, where they they compared an elite race walkers, and we're talking these guys were Olympic athletes like we're not talking they just kind of you know got the top in Australia they got they had Canadians they had uh, Japanese athletes they had um, I'm pretty sure there's a guy from New Zealand at least one that was over there for that Um, for three weeks they fed them at the AIS so they controlled all of their meals and they compared uh, chronic high carbohydrate chronic low carbohydrate so ketogenic and then a periodized um, diet where the, the carbohydrate was relative to Um, the training sessions and again we know from a lot of the um, adaptation literature that it's it's good sometimes to not train with carbohydrate there's going to be plenty of situations for athletes where they don't have optimum carbohydrate stores or intake and they need to be able to adapt to not using it but in the same vein if 
they have carbohydrate available or they are feeding with carbohydrate, it's important that their body is adapted to using it as well. Um, so they found that there was yeah a, a detriment in terms of their walking or their efficiency was reduced when they had the on the high fat diet. So it cost them more oxygen, which again makes sense. Fat is a a more you know costly um, substrate to break down, um, but that's not really what you want. You don't really want a more inefficient athlete at a you know a higher percentage of their um, of their p- performance and. I know a lot of people say, oh, but we've got so many fat stores. And, yeah, we do have so many fat stores, but you've still got to, you know, liberate those, the free fatty acids into the bloodstream to be able to use it. And then breaking down that free fatty acid costs a lot more oxygen than it does break down carbohydrates. So I definitely think um, periodized nutrition is the way to go. I think some, you know, sessions need to be done in terms of low carb and, and creating adaptations or fasted because you're going to get um, a different set of responses that it's always good to hammer the body with with different um, stimuluses in terms of keeping it you know I guess in tune and and trying to keep adapting to the stimulus of of the exercise and nutrition can help you know sort of exacerbate that at times um yeah, but um, Jill's other study that she's been looking at um, is looking at whether it is when you change something in someone's diet. So you change carbohydrate, you you see so you lower it. You typically increase fat, and keep protein the same. So when you're comparing high carbohydrate and and low carbohydrate diets, you're typically you know looking at fat and carbohydrate changing. We don't actually know if it's the carbohydrate being low or the fat being high that's having the effect in terms of the performance outcomes that have been looked at. Um, so Jill's study lately, the one that she's just finished last, uh, collecting data last year, was looking at a, a high fat, low carb diet. So a, a typical sort of uh, 65% fat intake versus a, a high protein, low carb. So keeping the carbohydrate low in both conditions to see is it the is it the fat availability that's driving the effects or is it the low carbohydrate that's driving the effects and i'd love to give you all the results but she's still analyzing um so that's something that'll come out soon and and again it's it's mechanistic it's not like we're saying this is what athletes should have we're just trying to say what is it what is it that's having having the effect because in the current studies you can't tease that out yeah i mean we'll have to have a another catch up further down the line and dig into it a little bit i'm sure i can i can make that work for you maddie awesome Eva. hey awesome to chat and uh i really get going sounds like dinner and meltdowns are happening yeah good good to chat with you anyway and uh, yeah happy to happy to chat another time i hope that's useful for your podcast anyway Well, there you have it. I hope you found that interview, one, interesting, and two, uh, helpful. Um, And if you've got any extra questions for Evelyn, please send them to me, and we can potentially get her back on for a follow-up session to answer some of your questions. Like I said in the introduction, she is an absolute wealth of knowledge and is right there in amongst the research. So if you do have any questions, let me know, and we will get her back on the show if that's what you want to see. Now we're going to jump into uh, listener Q&A about Masters Athletes. Here it is. Hi, Maddie. I uh, love your podcast. Um, I'm a 57-year-old ex-runner who now rides bikes, and uh, I found through the years that most training plans are a bit too much for older athletes in that our recovery requires more time than allotted usually. Uh, two questions. Have there been uh, many studies on older athletes and how their training plans should vary, at least from the typical plans out there? And two, how, uh, as an older athlete, do I know if a training plan is too much to tackle? Thanks. Alrighty, mate. Thanks for your questions. Greatly appreciated. And just remember, if you have a question, please submit a voice question simply by heading over to the Exponential Performance Coaching website. But all you've got to do is hit hit the record button, record your voice message, send it in. I'll do my best to answer it. 
And as a wee thank you, I'm going to send you a free copy of the Exponential Performance Temple Handbook Package. So, moving on to this question, is there much research around older athletes and how to adjust their training? Well, there is quite a lot of research done into Masters athletes, and Masters athletes sort of encompasses uh, a wide range of athletes, uh, with a different sports having different age criteria for the Masters division. A lot of the research is around the, these age-related decreases in performance and what mechanisms cause these age-related decreases. So what I want to touch on firstly is that, and then we're going to have a think about how you would adjust a training program for a a master's athlete. So why does our performance decrease as we get older? Well, there's there's a host of reasons, and largely it's to do with a a decrease in testosterone in, in males and in females, and also the estrogen changes that occur in women. And what these do is these change muscle mass, and when we get a change in muscle mass, a lot of other underlying things happen. Largely also as a large decrease in VO2 max as we age. So that's our maximal oxygen consumption, our body's ability to take in oxygen and use it, the maximal rate at which that happens. And this decrease often occurs due to decrease in muscle capillary density, a decrease in stroke volume. So stroke volume is the amount of blood that is ejected from your heart with every beat. Uh, That decrease in muscle mass, decrease in aerobic enzyme activity, and also a change in our muscle fiber uh, type or composition. And there is very much a shift to the percentage of type 1 muscle fibers, those slow twitch muscle fibers, which is why a lot of athletes will maintain their endurance as they age, but they won't actually um, be able to hold on to that speed. And all of this leads to effect, like I said, the VO2 max, their anaerobic or lactate threshold, and also their economy of movement. So you're actually it actually requires more energy to do the same amount of work uh, in a master's athlete. So this decrease in performance Um, is most noticeable after the age of 55 and it seems that women's performances tend to decline faster than those those of men and that is especially the case in running. So we know that our performance decreases as we age uh, and depending on the sport it, it kind of varies which age that is and on the individual as well but Somewhere between sort of 35 and 45, we start to get these age-related performance decreases that become quite significant. Um, And then, as I said before, the greatest declining rate uh, occurs after the age of 55, and women's performances tend to decline a little faster. So what can we do about it? How do we approach master's athlete training? Well, when it comes to... Masters athletes, I don't, personally, I don't approach them any differently than I do with any other athlete that I work with, and that I'm not treating them or training them any differently because of their age. I am training them and uh, allocating the training load based on who they are personally. So it's really important to remember that just because of an athlete's age, it doesn't mean that they're going to be ready for a certain amount of training or you should train them at a certain load. It's going to come down to them personally because some Masters athletes have got a huge uh, history of training. Others may be quite new and also they may have um, different focus things they need to work on. So it, it doesn't come back to this is a Masters athlete, they're of a certain age we need to give them this training program, it comes back to the individual. This individual needs this to help them improve their performance. In thinking about that, there are a couple of things that uh, Masters athletes, I believe, need to focus on. There is some research out there that indicates the reason Masters athletes' performance decreases is because of their training intensity. So their training intensity decreases, and that leads to, obviously, the performance decrease. So with Masters athletes, what I really like to focus on is injecting some intensity into their training, and I find that really helps because often they'll be doing a lot of 
steady state endurance work naturally just falling into that comfort zone so some high intensity work seems to work really well so one thing i really believe that all masters athletes should do is strength training after the age of about 40 45 we start to get this age related decrease in muscle mass so our muscles start to decrease in size so not only for performance is this important but just general life uh, health and function as you age so if you can get into some form of strength work it's going to be key so it's not just our muscles that start to atrophy or get smaller it's also our uh, tendons and ligaments as well so I find that some of that masters athletes that I work with they really start to struggle with tendon injuries or reoccurring tendonitis, little niggles, pulled calves, that sort of thing. So strength training will really help this out. Also refer back to what I've just been talking about as well about gelatin supplementation and potentially that helping uh, with those uh, tendon ligament injuries as well. The other thing that uh, was pointed out when the question was asked was about recovery the the person who was asking the question didn't feel that training plans that had been on in the past uh, didn't have enough recovery for him as a master's athlete and while you know we we do take longer to recover as we age just because the body's processes take a little longer and that's largely to do with uh, decreases in testosterone level testosterone is one of our key anabolic hormones and anabolic is just that building up that repair of um, muscle fibers enzymes everything in the body really so it is important that we do uh, allow some extra recovery how much recovery again it's not so much because uh, it's a master's athlete we're dealing with it comes back to that individual I have um, young athletes that are training really hard I have them on more recovery than other athletes their same age just because they seem to respond better to that so it's not so much about masters athlete need X amount of recovery in general yes they're going to require more just because of slower recovery but again it comes back to that individualized approach I would say at least everybody should have at least one recovery day per week and I've found that a lot of athletes really, really respond well to having two recovery days per week, depending on who they are, external factors such as life, uh, life factors such as work, family, um, on top of their, of their training stress as well. So how would you know if uh, a training program or a training plan I'm assuming here that you're talking about a non-personalized plan. Say you've just you can just buy one off the internet or download a free one. How would you know if that is too much for you? And this comes back to everybody, not just masters athletes. How do you know if a training program is going to be too much for you? Well, I think a really good starting point is to sit down and have a realistic look at how much time you have to commit to training. Uh, each week rather than trying to cram a training program into your week have a think about how much time you've got to commit and then if a plan that you're looking at is greater than the amount of time you actually have you probably know that it's going to be too much eventually because you're going to have to sacrifice something else to fit this training in and often the sacrifice comes in terms of our sleep usually So if you're looking at the overall weekly hours of a training program and you're not even going to be able to fit it realistically into your week already, it's probably likely that it's going to be too much for you. So just have a think about that. Have a think about those recovery days. How much recovery do you feel that you need between your key sessions? And no doubt you've probably got a pretty good grip on this. If you were to go out for a long endurance ride or a really hard interval session, how long does it take for you personally to recover from it? Some people will bounce back pretty quick. Others may need a little longer. So sit down with the training plan or training program. Have a look at where the key sessions are 
and think to yourself realistically, am I going to be able to recover between the key sessions? If you're not sure, then it's probably going to be too much, to be honest, because when you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh, yeah, that's probably doable, then as things start to accumulate, life factors come into it as well, you'll probably find that you start falling behind, slacking on that recovery. So definitely have a look at that. So just as a little bit of a summary for Masters Athletes, I understand I'm starting to waffle on a little bit. So for Masters Athletes, we know that there's an age-related decrease in performance, but we can help minimize this with some smart training. First thing, highly recommend that Masters Athletes perform some form of strength training work to maintain that muscle mass as it starts to atrophy away as we age. Second of all, I have personally found working with a number of Masters athletes that some strategic high-intensity work pays real dividends later on because it seems as athletes age, that high-intensity work starts to drop off and they gravitate naturally towards that steady-state endurance work. So some high-intensity work in there as well can be of great benefit. Also, pay particular attention to your recovery. You may find that you need additional recovery to perform your key sessions. And often, a lot of people will get good benefits by dialing things back a little bit, giving themselves a little bit more recovery time between their key sessions. And this is also really important, not just for physiological recovery, but also recovery of uh, muscles, tendons, and ligaments that are supporting all the load they when they get loaded they require a little bit more time to to get back to baseline and if you'll find you've got little niggly injuries creeping on in could be a sign that you're not getting enough recovery or addressing those recovery modalities as well, as well. stretching foam rolling mobility type work to keep all those structures working soundly so i hope that has answered your question if it hasn't Send me another voice message in with a little bit more specific information and I will do my best to answer it. So there we have it, Masters Athletes Training. Done. Now that's a wrap today for episode 6 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. Please, if you have a question, please send me in a voice message. A voice message. That way I'm going to prioritize those questions over the written questions, which I'm still getting a lot of. I want to shape this show based on your feedback, so please keep it coming in, and I'm going to do my best to give you good quality, useful information that you can use to get out there and train hard, but most importantly, train smart. I'll see you next week.